The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Jesus unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Spirit has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The Spirit has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. Jesus returned to Galilee. But from where was he returning? Last week, we were with Jesus in Cana at a wedding. But last week, we were also reading from a different gospel, the Gospel of John. So if it is not Cana and the wedding from which Jesus is returning, where is he coming from? Well, it might just be a good idea for us to reorient ourselves to what the chain of events has been for Jesus until now in Luke's gospel. We can go all the way back to Christmas, to the nativity, the birth story that kicks off the gospel. And then the Sunday after Christmas, we heard about our 12-year-old tween Jesus getting separated from his parents and being found eventually in the temple. And from there, the story skips 18 whole years to Jesus' baptism by John in the River Jordan and the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove and a voice from the heaven announcing, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Then, full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days, where he's met and confronted by the adversary, the devil. A time of being stretched in the limits of his humanity, physically and mentally. And so now this is where we come today. We come into the story as Jesus is returning from the wilderness to Galilee. And he's traveling around the surrounding area, the power of the Spirit still with him, tangible, and the word is spreading about him. People are praising his teaching. Eventually, he arrives in Nazareth, Jesus' boyhood home. And it's the Sabbath day. And naturally, he goes to the synagogue. Where else would he be? An observant Jew attending the synagogue of his childhood, surrounded by those who know him as Joseph the carpenter's son. And he's handed the scroll of Isaiah to read. And the first words out of his mouth are, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. From his baptism, to the time in the wilderness, to the beginning of his public ministry, the Spirit is a constant presence, filling Jesus, leading Jesus, anointing Jesus. The Holy Spirit is connected directly to Jesus' identity. And his identity, as it's announced at the time of his baptism, is that he's the beloved son, the anointed one. And he has been anointed by the Spirit of the Lord for a purpose, a mission. And as he continues to read, we hear him say, it's to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, let the oppressed go free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
All these events leading up to this moment in time, and most likely and especially those 40 days in the wilderness, have brought clarity to Jesus and his identity and his mission. And here it is. On Jesus' lips, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, which would really be words from God, the reading and the teaching for the day in his gathering of his hometown faithful. And the Spirit is at work. And all the people gathered to hear him in the synagogue believe he's reading Isaiah's words. They weren't at his baptism. They weren't in the wilderness. But filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, all eyes are fixed on him. And Jesus doesn't leave those words to the prophet Isaiah. But Jesus claims those words, the identity and the mission as his own. And he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he's saying that stuff Isaiah wrote about a long time ago, but today it's me. It's what I have been anointed to do. Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, claims his identity as the anointed one and claims his mission to proclaim the good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So if someone were to ask you for a description of who Jesus is and what the kingdom of God looks like, you probably can't go wrong using the scripture passage as a foundation for your answer. But these things Jesus lists as the goals of his mission, they can feel sort of distant, not so connected to us now, the language feeling a little remote from our day-to-day -day experience. In the season of Epiphany, this season of the revealing of Jesus as Savior of the world, these words from Luke, which are words from Jesus, which are words from Isaiah, which are words from God, they serve as a good jumping off point to think about where we see this mission of Jesus continuing on in our here and now. And how, for us as Jesus' disciples, we might also claim this identity and this mission as our own, too. Proclaiming good news to the poor might be the easiest to recognize. When food and shelter, medicine, water, other services are provided to someone in need, well, that is indeed good news. Family Promise here at Gloria Day is one of the first thing that comes to mind for me. Family promise is all those things and maybe even a step more. A way of providing for those immediate needs, yes, but also something that offers a way past that need to a long-term solution. And with an average of 45 days of support to save money, find work, secure housing, it's an effort to break the cycle, to offer a way to get ahead. A continuation of support beyond a meal or a place for the week or the night. And it's all given through the task of hospitality, which seems simple enough but does require some sacrifice. A little inconvenience, a little juggling of our time and juggling of our space in the building, giving up an overnight or a few weekend hours but all of it translating into good news. And hopefully not for just a night or a week, but into a new future. Release to the captives might be a little harder for us to imagine. But sadly, captivity, slavery is still happening here in the US and all over the world. Our women of the ELCA have made it a priority in recent years to bring awareness to the reality of human trafficking. And there are over 12 million people worldwide who are victims of this modern day slavery. 80% of them female, and over 50% of those under the age of 18. And there are other forms of captivity. There's the stigma that follows those who have been incarcerated, who live with mental illness, who are struggling or recovering from addiction. 
while we may not have an example to draw on as readily as we can draw on family promise. There are any number of opportunities locally in different ways that we're all connected to living out this part of the mission we've been called to as followers of Jesus. Recovery of sight to the blind is not only about sight, I think, but healing for all types of illnesses. I recently sat in a hospital room and marveled at the science that has progressed too quickly, so quickly in recent decades, allowing for these what are now commonplace life-saving heart surgeries. And as a church, we've walked for years for the Relay for Life that benefits the American Cancer Society, bringing about awareness, research, and as I've learned for their recent, more recent ad campaign, and which I've been appreciative of, is not just about those walks and raising funds for research, which is vital, but also providing rides and support groups and other resources to cancer patients. And so many of you participate in a variety of walks, raising awareness, raising funds throughout the year for cancer, for Alzheimer's, for ALS, for heart disease. It goes on. And Glory Day is also a congregation for Stephen Ministry. And while recovery from illness is not the only instance when Stephen ministers offer support, they are for sure taking part in this piece of the mission. In our prayer chain and our prayer shawl ministry as well, they send sending cards and visiting one another. They're all pieces of that calling that Jesus names as recovery of sight to the blind. Surely in our lives of discipleship then, recovery of health and life is being proclaimed. And just this past week, our nation remembered Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Freedom from oppression is a long-held ideal in our nation that has a troubled history in its actual practice. And there's so many systems set in place for so long where the deck is stacked, especially against people of different races, but also of certain gender, and religions, and sexual preference. These systems have long been biased to favor the male, the white, the straight. And change is hard fought and it's uncomfortable. But our Southeastern Iowa Synod has an anti-racism task force. And they're tasked with helping congregations do the difficult work of examining the realities of racism in our own lives and in our communities. They help facilitate conversations around race designed to expand awareness, deepen understanding, examine systems of oppression, and develop ability for community healing across racial differences. The work of listening and open dialogue, the work of leveraging privilege, the work of a more honest telling of history is the mission of Jesus to let the oppressed go free. And that model of conversation from the anti-racism task force is really a good model for conversations around all of the isms. Proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor is Jesus referring to Jewish laws about a sabbatical year, often called a year of jubilee. That's a year of rest when land wasn't cultivated, when slaves were set free, and when loans or debts were forgiven. That could be pretty topsy-turvy if you think about it, and there's, there's no actual evidence that this year ever actually took place. What's good news for some can also be difficult news for others, and those tended to be the people in power. But what it points to, I think, in our day and time is the burden of debt. It's a crippling issue for many. The cost of student loans, medical insurance, the cost of living combined with jobs that do not meet the threshold of a living wage and or households depending on only one income, they're an equation that equals financial shortfall. And the recent government shutdown illustrates dramatically how many who are gainfully employed still live paycheck to paycheck, where a month without pay can quickly spiral a household into crisis. Here at Gloria Day, we've had a history of offering uh, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University as a way to help us learn about financial stewardship and to take steps to experience relief from the burdens of debt. 
and our Gloria Day Love Fund has helped members and non-members avoid that last resort of additional indebtedness by providing relief in financial emergencies. And although neither of these things really provides total relief and there is still work to be done on many fronts, we can make a proclamation that gives a taste of the year of the Lord's favor. In this time of transition in the life of our congregation, as we take stock and take time to reflect on God's mission for us, this word of God from Luke can be helpful. How are we living out others first? It can seem like a very broad mission at times with so many things that can fall under that umbrella. But perhaps the way Jesus claims this mission as his own can guide us to reconsider and strengthen the work we do together in his name. And as we pray and study, worship and give, serve, invite and encourage along our path of discipleship, how will we proclaim the good news to the poor, release to the captive, recovery of health and wellness, freedom to the oppressed, and relief from burdens? Trust in this. Jesus' mission is alive and well. And the Holy Spirit is busy and active. And the work of the kingdom of God is visible and revealed. The saving mission of Jesus that was fulfilled in the hearing of his reading of the scripture in Nazareth was once and for all fulfilled in his dying on the cross and rising to new life. And it's fulfilled once again in our hearing today. Just as we see Jesus at work in the world, he is alive and active in all of your lives. Present here in this gathering, in water and word, bread and wine, and between all of us as brothers and sisters in one body. So hear the promise of fulfillment. Receive the good news. All that impoverishes you, all that keeps you captive, all that binds, blinds you, all that oppresses you and burdens you, the crucified and risen Jesus has set you free. Sin, death, suffering, the bonds are broken, the wounds are healed, the weight is lifted. And you are sent by the Spirit to go now and live in the Lord's favor in God's mercy and love. In baptism, we are anointed and empowered by the same Holy Spirit as Jesus. The Spirit unites us with Jesus and with each other. And it's not only in our hearing the word that Jesus' mission is fulfilled, but it's fulfilled every day in the new life that we are each given. We share Jesus' identity and his mission. We share in his resurrection. And we are the body of Christ. Each of us serving as the eyes or the ears, the hands or the head, or the heart or the feet. For it is through people like you that all these examples that I listed earlier can come to be. Through your time and your love, your compassion, your abilities, your skills, and the gift of faith you've received through the Spirit. You, each living as individuals and together as the body, proclaiming good news to the poor, proclaiming release, recovery, letting the oppressed go free, proclaiming the Lord's favor. Amen. <clears throat>